Um, so this is an introduction to data visualization. We're going to be going over a very brief sort of history of how people started using data visualization, why they started using it, and then we'll take a look at how we are affected by visual patterns in our environment and how that makes data visualization work for us. Um, then we'll take a look at best practices for data visualizations, um, how to choose a data visualization. We'll look at tools um, and things like that. Um, now, before we, we get into all that, uh, there we go. Um, I like to think about why we visualize data in the first place, okay? So data visualization is a tool that's going to help us um, explore and understand complex patterns in large quantities of data. Complex patterns and large quantities of data are two keys there that we'll, we'll get back to in a second. But first, take, let's take a look at uh, the history. Um, and we're really talking about uh, the late 17 to early 1800s uh, when all this started uh, uh, really becoming popular. Um, and that was the case, especially with William Playfair, who was an economist at the time. And he uh, is the person who sort of uh, started really using all of these line charts and bar charts and pie charts in large numbers um, as we're used to seeing them today. Uh, and then later on, a man named John Snow did something really interesting with a map that sort of changed everything. So at the time, uh, there was this theory that um, illness, uh, sicknesses like cholera, for which there was an outbreak uh, in a certain neighborhood in London, a lot of people thought that uh, those things were, were caused by, by bad air, they called it miasma. And John Snow didn't really uh, believe this theory. Um, so what he did was every time there was a death uh, in, in this neighborhood in London, he took a map of the neighborhood and he put a little tick mark in that area where that death occurred. And the result was this really compelling piece of evidence that all the deaths were clustered around this one water pump in the city. So they removed the handle to the pump and the deaths abated. And that resulted in an entirely new field of study called epidemiology. And what I like about that story is that it shows that data visualization can help us answer questions by finding patterns in our data for, for sure, but it can also completely impact uh, the entire way that we think about doing things. It can entirely change our perspective. Um, and that's something that we still see today with data visualization. This is probably the most famous data visualization. Um, and the reason that it's so famous is because it does a really good job of bringing in different pieces of information, different pieces, different types of data, and linking them all together so that they work cohesively. Um, and so if we take a closer look at this, um, what we're looking at is uh, the, uh, a depiction of Napoleon's troops marching into Moscow and then their eventual retreat, okay? This uh, beige line across the top going from left to right um, is representing the number of troops. So when it is a wider line, we have more men, and when it is a narrower line, we have fewer men. Now the black line underneath going from right to left, that represents the retreat. So already we have this really uh, brutal sort of devastating story of what happened to these men, right? Um, but not only that, uh, we've got a line chart down here too, okay? So this line chart is also meant to be read from right to left because it's following along with this retreat. You can see lines drawn from different parts on the chart up to that, that black uh, band. And what this line chart is showing us is the temperature, this really cold, uh, 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 terrifying Russian winter that ended up causing a lot of this tragedy, right? Um, and, and in addition to that, we also have uh, geographic information. We've got rivers and things like that. Uh, I noticed um, earlier today when I was going through this that even some of the labels on this line chart bring in weather information. It's telling us pluie, which means rain right here. So it was raining on that day, right? 
So there's so much information here that's brought together and working together all at once. Um, and as a result, we have this really compelling story. Um, another uh, person I'd like to talk about uh, from this time is W.E.B. Du Bois. We didn't realize that he was not only a social scientist, a historian, and a civil rights activist, but that he actually uh, did quite a bit of data visualization himself. Um, here uh, you can see um, some, some things that he created, some pieces that he had for um, the World's Fair in Paris at the turn of the century. And he had an exhibit there uh, where he wanted to um, illustrate what African American life was like at that point in time. Um, and he called it an honest, straightforward exhibit of a small nation of people picturing their life and development without apology or gloss, and above all, made by themselves. So what's really striking about this piece of work and, and about other work that he does is it's so modern for his time. Okay, especially since we've got photographs in here that are brought in along with all of uh, this information, these, these numbers and this data. We've got an illustration of what um, the, uh, the dollar looked like at the time. We've got a table here, we've got a bar chart over here, and all of this is connected, all of this information is connected. We have stuff like this now that we call dashboards. Uh, like you may have heard of a product called Tableau or Power BI or one of those business intelligence tools that lets us bring in um, illustrative information as well as data and different types of charts and link them all together. This is what he was doing, right? Um, and then uh, we've got some more of his work here, which is also especially modern. Um, these sorts of, uh, this use of color, um, bright primary colors, and these abstract sort of swirling shapes, these became very popular among artists in the 20s and 30s. But W.E.B. Du Bois was doing it now, and I, or, or at the turn of the century, because I think he believed that um, he sort of like had his finger on the pulse of what people were starting to think about, how they were starting to put information together, and especially what got them to pay attention visually, which is a very important thing that we'll talk about later on. He, he had all, all, he was thinking about all of this um, going into the, to the uh, 20th century. Um, and if you wanna learn more about him or uh, see more of his work, there's a book that just came out recently called um, Data Portraits, Visualizing Black America, The Color Line at the Turn of the 20th Century. We have it here in the library too, if you wanna check the catalog to see if anyone's uh, checked it out. So if you think about all of that um, sort of historical type of data visualization, and you compare that to the types of data visualizations that we work with today, it becomes really obvious that there's so much more complexity and variety um, in the type of graphic symbols that we're supposed to be able to understand instantly when we open up a page like this, right? And not only that, but we can also uh, often click on these things and change these things because we're using them dynamically in a web browser, right? Uh, which just adds a whole nother dimension of complexity. So how is it um, that we're able to uh, perceive all of this information that's coming at us that uh, is using symbols that we may have never even you know, looked at before. I think the answer to that lies in the way that humans uh, perceive their visual environment, okay? Um, and that's uh, a large part of that is done through what we call the pre-attentive process. So this is a subconscious process. It's not a process that you think about consciously. It happens to you automatically, where your eye is drawn to certain features and patterns that stand out, that pop out of the environment, okay? It's sort of a form of human pattern recognition. And you can see how it works by looking at these paragraphs of numbers. If I told you to count all of the sevens, in this top paragraph, um, it would take you a, a bit of time. You would have to go most of the time digit by digit uh, to try and find those sevens and then keep track of how many you're finding. 
But if you did that with the second paragraph down, where the sevens are now a different color, they stand out, they're different, um, it's a lot easier to do. It goes a lot more quickly. And then finally, if I not only make the sevens a different color, but I make them bigger and bolder, uh, you don't even have to uh, go number by number. You don't have to think about it at all. You can just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? That's the pre-attentive process uh, in action. And there's more features outside of just size or color that affect that pre-attentive process. There's a lot of features, uh, such as maybe changing the way that something is positioned, uh, different orientations, um, the way things are, are clustered or gathered together or spread further apart will also direct your uh, attention and your understanding in different ways. And then if we bring in animation and lighting and, and things like that, we have all of these uh, other features as well. So these features that affect the pre-attentive process can be utilized by people who are creating data visualizations in order to help people understand what they're looking at. Um, we also have some uh, types of gestalt principles that can help us here. Gestaltism it, it was a form of psychology or a, a theory in psychology um, that was popular in the 50s, but what it really talked about was um, how we uh, automatically in our minds uh, see things as being grouped together or as being in separate groups or distinct parts based on these visual features, right? So if we have all of these circles that are the same color, the same clock size, and they're all close to one another, um, we think of them as being in a group. But if we take uh, different rows of those circles and change the color, of those circles, now we see these different rows as being separate from one another and within their own groups, okay? So again, these are other ways that we can uh, help people understand how information is being organized through visual cues. It's also helpful when we're creating data visualizations to keep in mind how our visual memory works. Right? So when we're looking at something, um, we're not actually uh, just staring at it steadily. Our eyes are moving back and forth very, very quickly, about two to five times a second. And while they're doing that, we're storing that pre-attentive information that we get through the pre-attentive process about color, shape, size, things like that. Um, we spend about three seconds gathering that into this, what, we call, what, what researchers call the iconic memory. And we can hold that pre-attentive information, that iconic information, for multiple objects at a time. There's been a lot of studies done about how many objects people can keep in their memory at one time, and it's usually around three to five, right? So that's important if we have a page with a bunch of different graphs on it, or a graph with a bunch of different objects in it, right? If we want people to be able to compare certain objects, they have a limit to how many they can remember at one time, how many features of those objects they can remember, right? Um, and then, of course, our long-term memory uh, does the heavy-duty process of um, receiving information from the working memory and reprocessing that information when we encounter something, something familiar. So, does anybody have any questions about what we discussed so far before I talk about how to select visualizations? Because we're going to take sort of that general knowledge of how visualizations work and bringing it, bring it into pr to practical use, okay? So, I think that we can break selecting visualizations down into a step-by-step -step process, where the first step is deciding if a visualization is actually necessary. And this is where that first slide I showed you comes into play. We have to ask ourselves, are we illustrating a complex pattern and or are we using a large quantity of data? Those are subjective terms, of course. It's going to depend on uh, each separate case. But one thing I can do is show you uh, an example of when we didn't need to use a data visualization. In this bar chart over here, you can see that we have two slightly different numbers. One is bigger and one is smaller. Did we really need a visualization to understand what's going on there? That one number is higher than the other? I'm, I'm, I think in most cases, for most people, they're not gonna need a visualization for that. I think for most of them, this sentence up at the top 
with maybe another, you know, detailed sentence about the numbers themselves, including the values themselves. That might be enough to understand this information, right? Um, another good thing to think about when you're trying to decide if you need a visualization or not is, are you going to answer a question with this? Are you making an argument to your audience? Are you trying to tell a story? Those three things can be very good reasons to use data visualization. Ultimately, we want to decide, is this going to be more informative than a simple table of numbers or a paragraph of text? Because again, a really simple table also over here is probably even overkill, right? The next step, once you've decided that, yeah, actually, I do need a data visualization, is to think about your audience. Um, because they're the people that you're trying to reach, right? You're not creating this data visualization for yourself necessarily, although there are some cases when we're still early on in the research process where we might be the audience. Um, that's fine. But when you're communicating, when you're presenting information, um, it's important to think about your audience as much as possible because they're the people that you need to tell something to, right? So how much do they know about the research subject you're talking about? How much uh, do they know about data analysis? Are they used to working with data? Are they used to looking at charts and graphs? Do you need to hold their hand throughout this? And especially, what are the norms and expectations in the field that you're researching or working in? Uh, we're going to see that oftentimes people only see what they expect to see, right, which can be a problem. So once you've thought about your audience, you can then decide what it is that you want to actually show them. Are you trying to show a distribution of values? Are you trying to show trends over time? Um, and you noticed here, you've noticed here that I've, I've got a number of different types of charts that we could use for these different things that we're trying to do. It's a very short list, right? And these types of charts, bar charts, scatter plots, line charts, a lot of people look at these and say, hmm, that's kind of boring. I've seen a lot of those before. I want to do something different and interesting and crazy and, and beautiful. That's fine. It's good to be creative. But there are some reasons why you might not want to start uh, looking for a lot of really uh, unusual charts, okay? Because although there are many, many, many different types of, of charts to choose from, people are creating new ones every day that don't even really have names, um, you'll find that a lot of them require specialized knowledge to understand. For example, uh, this chart up here, which has an, a number of different names, sometimes it's called a radar chart, sometimes it's called a spider web chart. Um, your data might fit really well into this chart. And it, it, it might make a lot of sense to you when you're creating it. But if someone is, is looking at it and they've never seen that chart before and they don't know how to read it or understand it, they're not going to take the time to figure it out. They're just going to move on. So whatever message you were trying to get across from them is not going to be effective. Okay, same with this waterfall chart that's used with financial data and things like that. Um, if your audience understands this chart, maybe they're, you know, they, they're uh, also within your field, then it would make sense to use it because they already know how to read it. But if they don't, they're not going to look at it. Um, so always keep your audience in mind when you're making a decision, again, and that goes for any decision, not just what type of chart to use. That goes for where should I put it on the page? What scale should I use? What title should I put on the axis? What color should it be? All of that, if you think about your audience, that will guide you to, toward making that, that decision correctly. So let's look at some scenarios. These are going to start out really easy and then get harder. So let's say that you are a journalist for a national paper and you're writing an article about crime and some people think that crime is going up, other people say that it's uh, diminished uh, over the years. But what actually happens is that the data tells a different story depending on the type of the crime, the geographic area and time period that is being studied. So first of all, should we use a, a data visualization in this particular scenario? I 
I see some of you nodding. Raise your hand if we think if you think we should use it. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, we should use a visualization here because uh, we get a different story depending on on uh, which parts of the data that we're looking at, right? So there's a little bit of a complexity there. So um, given the audience and the data, what is the best type of visualization, or in this case, visualizations, uh, to use for scenario one? What is something that we could use to visualize? Did you say a line graph? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a line graph is a great idea because we are looking at changes over time. And line graphs are our classic way to show that information. Does anybody have any other ideas of a type of visualization that we could use here? Yeah, so a scatter plot could be helpful, especially if we're comparing two different uh, variables to one another to see if there's a relationship between those variables, right? Um, we also have geographic information here. So what kind of visualization can we use for that? A map. Yep, a map uh, could be very engaging here, right? So there's a lot of options for scenario one. In scenario two, you are a social media developer for an ad agency. So you're one of these people who goes on Twitter and looks at, uh, you know, how many times your client's brand is being mentioned and tries to uh, drum up uh, activity on social media for your client's brand. And it turns out that mentions of the brand have gone down 32% since the previous week, right? So you give a weekly report, you have to report that to your client. Um, it turns out uh, sales also haven't changed during this period. So do you think we should use a data visualization in this scenario? This is a trickier one. See some people shaking their heads. Raise your hand if you think we should use one. Nobody. Um, I agree with you on that uh, because what we have here is not a lot of information, right? Our uh, mentions have gone down 32% um, and sales haven't changed. Also, if you're the social media manager, you're kind of not doing a great job here, right? So maybe that's not a story that you really want to emphasize in your report, right? So here's, here's a good situation where we just don't have enough complexity, we don't have enough data to warrant a visualization. So scenario number three, there's a good chance um, that uh, you're not going to know what type of, of uh, or, or what to say here, but that's all right. Uh, this one's a harder one. So you're a, a researcher studying Parkinson's disease. You're publishing uh, the results of a study that use microarrays to measure gene expression levels in mice. Your data set includes over 9,000 genes. So can we say yes or no to a data visualization? Raise your hand if you think we should use one in this scenario. Yeah, 9,000 genes, that's a pretty big data set, right? I mean, it's not the biggest I've ever seen by far, but it's fairly large. Um, so we're using microarrays. Does anybody know what those are and or what type of visualization is typically used for microarrays? A tree, a tree map or a heat map? Yes, a heat map. That is correct. Um, so this is what a heat map looks like. Now you probably know how to, to, to read this, right? This visualization? You know what they are, yeah. I don't know how to read this visualization. I don't know how, do any of you, does anybody know how to do it? So none of us know how to read this data visualization. Should the researchers still use it? Absolutely, right? If she's, it, it, and the answer for HSL was, it depends on the audience. Right. So, um, right. So if the researcher is publishing within her field, then it's likely that people who are reading her publication are going to know what this is, even though we don't. All right. 
So let's move on and talk about accuracy and visualizations because that's something that uh, people are generally concerned with and for good reason. In 1984, there was an experiment done that um, took a look at how accurately people could understand these different graphical representations of data points. And they found that when it came to things like position, it was easy for people to understand accurately what was going on. Right, because if you think about it, we have two numbers that are close together. They're being represented by two dots that are close together. Our two numbers are far apart. Those two dots are far apart. That's pretty easy. Everybody, you know, pretty gets pretty much gets that intuitively. Um, also with length, right? Length uh, tends to be easy for people to interpret. But then when we get into things like angles and area and volume, it's a little bit harder people are less accurate in their understandings of those representations of data. So these rankings can be useful to us when we want to create accurate visualizations. Uh, but keep in mind that they're not set in stone. Um, it doesn't mean that we can never use area or, or color or anything like that. It um, just means that we should use this as a guide, okay? Let's take a look at these three charts, uh, a pi, a pie chart and two um, bar charts here. And first of all, raise your hand if you think the pie chart looks best. If you think it's the best looking chart up here. Raise your hand if you think the middle bar chart looks best. What about the uh, last bar chart? Who likes that one? Okay. Now I want you to look at those gray areas on each chart, areas B and C and tell me which of these charts makes it easier for you to see the difference between B and C. Raise your hand if it's the pie chart. What about the middle bar chart? Yeah, so everybody always raises their hand on that one. And that's because the bar chart is using length, right? It's easier for us to interpret the difference between length of objects or the length of those bars as opposed to the angles of the pie chart. And the reason we have a problem with this one over here um, is because these stacked bar charts um, make it a little bit difficult to, to read what's going on. The bottom that starts at zero, that's easy for us. We can see it goes up to eight, right? No problem. Then uh, area B goes from eight to about you know uh, 11 or 12. And so we have to subtract eight from 11 and compare that to the first bar. And then we have to do a lot of extra mental work there that we don't have to do with this middle bar chart. So um, let's take a look at some best practices for us to follow when we're creating visualizations. Uh, one of the most important ones, when we are using uh, these bar charts, these vertical bar charts, we need to, uh, especially, we need to start the scale at zero, okay? And I'll show you why. So here we have a bar chart that's showing us enrollment rate at a school over time. If we look at the year 1996, where these orange lines are pointing, we also have the year 1993 being pointed out to us. We can see that 1996, uh, the bar there is about twice the size as 1993. So it looks like twice as many people have enrolled in 1996. But if we pay attention to the actual numbers on the axis, it tells a different story. In fact, there's only a 2.5% difference between those two years. And the reason that it looks like it's twice the amount is because we're missing a whole bunch of data along the bottom here. We're missing it because we started our scale at 60 instead of at zero, right? So that gives us an inaccurate visualization of what's going on. So we always want to start the bar chart at zero. Um, a lot of people, a lot of times people don't know that and so they make a mistake they're trying to save room on the page or something like that um, and so we have that issue but also a lot of times this is done on purpose and i have seen it done uh plenty of times recently um within uh local tv news seems to be one of the 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 biggest problems with creating a, a bar charts like this and in, in politics um it can be a very popular distortion tactic so it's a good thing to look out for when you're examining a bar chart, because this will happen. Um, also, uh, we can do some, some pretty 
uh, uh, bad things with scale um, without trying to. If you're looking at these three line charts on the left here, they look very, very different, but they are actually using the exact same data. Okay, um, this line chart at the bottom, we've, uh, we've formatted it so it's really wide. We can see every month on our horizontal axis. Um, whereas this vertical chart, we've squeezed it all together. And this vertical chart makes it look like there's this event that happened in June that just happened had this catastrophic effect and set everything tumbling down. Uh, but if we look at it in this chart that's formatted this way, that effect doesn't seem nearly as bad or uh, as, as um, uh, dramatic, right? So that's one thing to keep in mind uh, when, you're, when you are uh, setting up your axes. Another thing um, that is, is probably worse really is when we have uh, two different scales in the same graph, one on each axis. So over on the left side here, we have a line and that um, the scale for that line goes from 400,000 to 800,000 troops, right? And then the scale on the right is for our bars and our bars go from zero to 250 billion. Okay, so these scales are so wildly different that when we start to cross them, when our, our data starts to overlap here, it gets confusing about which axis we're supposed to be paying attention to and people don't interpret this information very well or very clearly. Now, are we showing a, a trend that may or may not be accurate? Yes, we can, we can kind of see that, but we are causing a lot of distortion in the way that uh, people's visual perceptions work down here, okay? So that's something to worry about. Now, when we've got multiple lines on a line graphs, uh, on a line graph, uh, what we want our audience to pay attention to is the vertical difference between those two lines so that they can, because they're comparing them, they're looking at the difference, right? That's what we want them to do. But what our eyes will naturally do is focus on the shortest distance between the two lines, which is not going to be accurate in, in terms of comparing them. So um, if we can, it is ideal for us to actually take the difference of those two lines ourselves, subtract one from the other, and then plot that difference, right? Because this gives a much clearer picture of what it is we want people to see in the first place. 3D charts, um, I'm strongly against these. Most uh, people in the data visualization world are, especially when it comes to pie charts, okay? Um, so when we try to make a, a, a 3D, an object be, appear three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface, we have to employ all these artistic techniques um, like fore, uh, foreshadowing and, and, or um, uh, all kinds of distortion, right? And uh, what that does is it makes these angles even more inaccurate. It's even harder for people to interpret uh, these, these angles. Foreshortening, that was the term that I was looking for. Um, when we do that, we have a problem with our angles and it makes it really difficult to understand pie charts correctly. Um, if you uh, take a look over here though, at this um, example, which you won't see as often, usually we're illustrating a mathematical function or something complex like that. Um, you'll notice that the reason that this is okay in my book is because we have all three of our axes. We have our x-axis, our y-axis, and we have what we call our z-axis up here when we're doing that, that um, 3D uh, plotting. Um, and all of these axes have numbers on them, right? These axes are representing actual information. We have units, we have numbers, okay? So this is an okay way to use three-dimensional plotting. In, 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 in my perspective, um, this is not. Whenever we have text, uh, we want that text to be easily readable to our audience. And this can be a problem when we have vertical bar charts sometimes because we have long labels and they'll run into each other if we display them horizontally or so that we can read them from left to right. So we display them vertically, they're harder to read. Um, some programs like Microsoft Excel will put them at an angle which makes it a little bit easier. But I think, 
for, for all of the line charts, or I'm sorry, all the bar charts that I create these days, I want to do it horizontally by default. I start out horizontal because that way my text is much easier to read. It looks a lot more organized um, and it, I can nicely order things and arrange things in a way that um, people can instantly understand when they're looking at it. We also want to look at our data to ink ratio. So this is a, a, a term that's used sometimes in data visualization. Really what it's talking about is how many graphical elements do we have in a chart and how many of those elements are actually representing data. In this first chart, we've got this crazy background um, and all these rainbow colors and drop shadows. So this is something where we've got a lot of graphical elements that aren't representing data, but we're going to fix it. Um, we take away the background. You notice we've also taken away that legend on the side. Why? Because we've already got everything labeled. A uh, legend is just labeling it twice, so we don't need to do that. We've taken away down here, we've taken away the drop shadows, we've taken away those um, rainbow colors, which weren't necessary. It looks like we've kept one color to highlight one of the bars, that's to bring people's attention to that bar. Maybe we're telling a story about bacon or something like that, which is fine. But otherwise, we don't need all those different colors in there because they're not representing any type of information. We've gotten rid of some of these <coughs> um, uh, lines that are drawn around everything that are cluttering everything up. And then over here, we've, we've done something a little bit dramatic. We've taken away our axes entirely. We've taken away our grid lines and our reference lines. And we've put the actual values directly on top of the bars, right? Um, so some people will argue that we've we've removed um, some guides for helping people understand the visualization but a lot of people really like this minimal style i think you're okay with either one of these i think either one of the bottom two are are fine for uh displaying information in a way that's efficient and easy to understand um a classic trick of the trade when you're doing anything that's visual, after you've been staring at it for a long time, it's hard to understand how other people are gonna look at it when they look at it for the first time. So one thing you can do is take a step back from it and sort of squint your eyes so that your vision blurs a little bit. And when you do that, certain elements of the visualization are gonna pop out at you because you're reactivating that pre-attentive process. You're making your brain do that again, where it's looking for patterns. And so it'll see certain things that pop out. And then you'll know those are the things that are going to pop out to other people when they look at this for, you know, a, a half of a moment that most people will look at things when they're flipping through a, a publication or what have you, right? Um, and that way you can make sure that the most important information is what's jumping out. If it's not uh, the most important information, then you need to think about changing your visualization. So this, I think, is an interesting story. On the left, we have a chart called Iraq's Bloody Toll. What does this chart look like to you? What are these bars on this chart doing? What do they resemble? Blood, that's right. Um, so what's going on here is that we're starting at zero on our vertical axis like we're supposed to. But as our numbers get bigger, our bars are going downward instead of upward, which is the opposite of what most people are used to seeing. And this uh, chart came, became viral on the internet. You know, people really liked it. They thought it was really creative and interesting um, and a, a, an interesting sort of take or technique to use uh, it, in terms of visualization and in terms of design. Okay, it was highly appreciated. So one of the people who saw that chart decided to use that technique herself on a chart that she was creating about gun deaths in Florida. And she worked for the um, Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And she created this chart. She did the same thing. Um, at, she started uh, at zero up at the top. And then as the numbers got bigger, as the deaths, the gun deaths got higher, she went down instead of up. When people saw this chart, they got really angry. And they believe that uh, the, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement was trying to lie to them or mislead them with this. 
So my question to you is, why was this chart on the left successful while the chart on the right was not? Yes. That's a very good point. So the response was that the chart on the left has additional information uh, to help the reader understand what's going on, which is absolutely true. Um, I think that does uh, help quite a bit. But there's some uh, something else going on here, specifically in the way that these charts are set up. That's different. And that is our uh, horizontal axis on the Iraq chart is at the top, which we don't expect. We usually see that at the bottom. On this one, it's still at the bottom, right? So on the left, this chart is completely flipped. It's completely upside down. And uh, our brains go, wait a minute, what's going on here? Something's different. The one on the right, we don't have that because our chart isn't flipped. So we just see what we expect to see. And people will always see what they expect to see unless you are certain to subvert their expectations. So being creative is good. Um, it's, it's a top priority for if you're in uh, using data visualizations because uh, that's how you get people's attention. That's how you get people to listen to you. People have incredible amounts of information coming at them all the time. How are you going to get them to pay attention to your message? Well, you can use creativity. But there is a priority higher than being creative, and that priority is to be clear, to make sure that people understand and understand accurately what it is that you're trying to tell them. Okay, so until you become a master at your craft, I would not try to subvert people's expectations because it can be really hard to do. People see what they expect to see. So let's talk about color for a second because I think people get tripped up on, on color from time to time. It can be challenging if you're not used to working with it. Um, as we saw in, in another chart before, um, using a rainbow full of colors is often uh, not effective. Uh, what information is color giving us on this chart? We have a bar for each of the different states in the US, and each of those different states has a different color associated with it. What information does color give us? Nothing, right. How, whereas if we look at this map on the left, it, uh, we're using color to make it very easy for us to see where clusters of low unemployment uh, versus clusters of high unemployment are in the US. And when we're working with color, it's important to remember that there is a significant portion of the population that's colorblind. And the most common type of colorblindness is red green colorblindness. And it's really easy for us to make our visualizations accessible to people who have red green color blindness. All we have to do is not use both red and green in the same chart. We can use one, we can use the other, we can use neither, right? Just don't use them both at the same time and we're good. Um, when it comes to maps, um, certain uh, types of software will produce these rainbow maps where we have different ranges of values that are being represented by different colors, all the different colors of the rainbow. Studies have been done on this and have found that people have a hard time reading and interpreting these maps, as opposed to when we use a natural scale, where we're going from dark to light or light to dark. If the number is high on this map, it's dark. If the number is low, it's light. People have a much easier un time understanding uh, these types of color scales. Um, and there's a number of different types of natural scales, so you don't always have to use dark to light. You can uh, use what we call a diverging color scale, where we go from one color, like orange, to another color, like blue, um, and we get lighter in the middle around the, the median. Um, and then there's also a natural type of scale that we don't see as often where we look at saturation. Saturation is the amount of gray uh, that is or isn't in the color. So going from a low saturation to high saturation can also be a type of natural scale to use. So you don't always have to make it uh, boring and typical. You can use some of these other types. There are some great resources for working with color on the internet. Color Brewer is a tool that will help you pick 
color scales that are friendly to colorblindness or printers or things like that. You can select uh, from a list. There is also something called Coblis, which is a colorblindness simulator. So this lets you upload images and then shows you how they'll, they'll appear to someone who has whatever type of colorblindness you select. Okay. Um, and in terms of color, it's not always the best way to group and categorize and label our data, right? Um, and you, you'll know that um, if you've ever uh, looked at something with someone else and said, you see that blue spot over there, and they'll say, what do you mean? That's teal or that's green or purple or whatever. We see color very differently. And so when we have a lot of colors that are close together. It can be difficult to communicate. It can be difficult to talk about those. So we don't always need to use color. Another way of organizing our information, of categorizing and grouping our information, is to use what we call small multiples, right? So small multiples are small charts, which we often use uh, in multiplicity. So uh, um, a very common type of uh, uh, small multiple is a scatterplot matrix. How many of you have seen or used a scatterplot matrix before? Okay, just a few of you, so I'm gonna uh, explain how to use this, right? So you can, what we wanna do is go in a clockwise direction, and we're looking at our axes here. Um, this text is the labels for our axes on each of these charts. So our vertical axis on this top chart is internet usage, and our horizontal axis is mobile phone usage. Our vertical axis for this chart, again, internet usage, the horizontal axis is urban population. Here it's mobile phone usage and urban population. Why do we do this? Well, it lets us visualize very quickly different relationships, different patterns between multiple variables all at once. So we can compare the, all those different relationships to each other, right? Over on this side, I've demonstrated what this would look like if instead of having a bunch of different charts, I just used color to represent the third variable. So on my vertical axis, I have internet usage. On my horizontal axis, I have mobile phones. And then I used color, uh, red to blue, to represent urban population. Very difficult to see the relationships in that case, right? So color isn't really helping us here. It's much better to use more than one chart. Some other situations where that happens, we already know that these stacked bar charts are difficult to read, especially if we have ones with so many different colors in them. If we put them into this grid format, it's a lot easier for us to do. We just have a bunch of different bar charts that we can compare to one another. Uh, line charts. Um, this one isn't too terrible, but uh, we have overlapping here. It's kind of difficult to read. We might call it a spaghetti chart. If we break the lines out from one another, they're, they're easier to understand. So let's take a look at some visualizations now. These are some visualizations that I found in the wild um, that I think that we can make some improvements to because they're, they're coming up a little short. So in this case, um, there was a poll done on mine um, about the Canadian $20 bill. Um, they're, putting a, a woman on the $20 bill, and they pulled people to find out uh, which women they think should be on that bill. Roberta Bondar was the first Canadian woman in outer space. Can anybody tell me how, uh, what percentage of people voted for Roberta Bondar? What if I tell you she's the orange one? Still doesn't really help, yeah. So maybe, what, what are some things you guys think we could do to make this visualization better and easier to read and understand? I heard someone say horizontal bar chart. I agree with that. I definitely think we should move away from this pie chart scenario. Anybody else? Adding numbers by the names, bringing our labels together. I really like that idea. I'll show you the idea that I had. Horizontal bar chart, numbers as labels by the names. Both ideas are great. Um, but I also grouped a lot of these people into a category called other. And I put that down at the bottom, okay? 
So I think that way we can focus uh, this way on the, on the top uh, number of people and we can find Roberta Bondar. She's over here at 3.9%. So let's take a look at this one. Um, this is a report that is done uh, regularly by the Chicago, or I'm sorry, the Colorado Department of Transportation. And uh, what we're looking at here is information on uh, fatal crashes. And so we have a few different axes here. On the left axis, we have the number of uh, fatal crashes um, following our bars, okay? That number goes from zero to 120. On the right axis, we have the number of fatal crashes uh, for our line, okay? And that goes from negative 20 crashes up to 70. So two completely different scales. Then for each of our bars, we have clustered bars here. Um, the green bars are for the year with the lowest fatal crashes. The yellow bars are for the year with the average, or for, are, represent the average. And then the orange bar is the year of the highest number of fatal crashes. And then that line that's laid on top of here is for 2016. So we're comparing 2016 um, to all of the other years. Okay, so our current year on top of all of the other years. Does anybody have any ideas of how we might be able to fix this, make this a little easier to read? So the response that I got was multiple charts and that this is too busy, which I 100% agree with. And I absolutely do think we should use multiple charts here. I think that is definitely warranted at this point. Okay. Any ideas about what types of charts we should use? Well, I will show you what I came up with. Um, so up here, we have something that isn't really a specific type of chart at all, uh, but it, it's similar to a box plot, where we're looking at the minimum, the average, and the maximum for each of our months, okay? Um, and I think that looking at it this way, instead of with bars, we're able to see, we're able to understand a, a greater range of the distribution for each of those years. Like we have, um, the, the average in August is very far away from the maximum. So we can see uh, that the different distributions for each year much more easily this way. I also separated that line and put it on its own chart so that it wasn't um, mis, uh, misleading people. Um, but what happened here is that we used a different scale for this line so that it wouldn't be overlapping the chart. Right, but what, what, what that caused was for people to send this chart around and say, look, uh, this is the year uh, after we've uh, legalized marijuana in the state of Colorado and look at how much higher all of the crashes this year are, right? It's misleading. They're actually quite within the normal range of what we're used to seeing, right? I've also put this table over here um, to look up the highest and lowest year for each month, since that what it, uh, was available in, with this information here in case people wanted to do that. But what trend are we seeing with this top chart up here? Has anybody noticed a trend here? Higher in the summer, right. So that's what we are supposed to be getting from this chart over here, which I think we, we can understand a little bit easier this way. So um, going over some key concepts real quick before I talk about tools. Um, our visualizations are going to be most effective uh, and informative when we're using complex data, when we're telling a story, when we're answering a question, when we are, have a very large set of data, right? We want to consider our audience at all times. Um, and there are certain graphical elements that we can use that are going to be more accurate than if we used others. We don't want to use multiple scales at the same time. We uh, want to think about what's popping out in our visualizations because that's what's going to attract the most attention and reach our audience the best. 
Um, we want to make sure that our visualizations are accessible to people with colorblindness. Um, and we want to consider whether using multiple charts is going to be a better road than just using one chart and trying to cram everything into that one chart. Above all, being clear is the most important thing. Clarity is key. Um, so let's take a look at some uh, tools that we can use. When we're talking about general data visualization, Tableau is probably one of my favorite tools here, um, especially for people who aren't familiar with programming languages who don't know how to program. Tableau is very helpful because it allows you to do very powerful things. It allows you to create those dashboards, right? Um, so uh, we can have a map, we can have bar charts, we can have statistics. <clears throat> And then we can have drop down menus that people can access dynamically to filter the data. If they only want to look at data for a certain state, they could roll over one of these states and get more information about that state, right? So there's all these dynamic things that we can do with Tableau, which makes it easier to use. They also have free access for you if you're a student or a uh, instructor, which is really nice. I'll be teaching a couple Tableau workshops um, later this semester. You can find those on our events page. Um, but uh, if you prefer to use Excel, uh, simply because you're more familiar with uh, Microsoft products, we can do that as well. Just make sure that you go into all the little options and menus and, and change all the little uh, different uh, toggles and switches and customize your charts because the charts that Excel produces automatically are usually not very good. Um, then there's a, a number of web-based tools that are free. Uh, all the ones in this list are free except for um, Plotly because it does some, some extra things. But these tools uh, can be helpful if you just need to create something really quick on a website um, and share that website with other people. So Data Wrapper, Chart Blocks, High Charts Cloud um, are all helpful tools to use for, for different types of visualizations. And I don't <clears throat> want to go too quickly because I know some of you are writing notes, but uh, I don't have many much time left. I will be sending these slides out to everyone. Okay, so for GIS, for working with maps, um, the most <clears throat> popular tool, the tool that's used in the industry professionally is ArcGIS. Um, and that's a whole suite of different software that you can use for mapping. ArcGIS is extremely expensive. Um, it only works on PCs. It won't work on your Mac. We have it here in the lab if you need to use it. Um, or you can use open source software called QGIS that does a lot of the same things. It's not as fancy and shiny as pro and professional, but it has a growing user base. So QGIS might be helpful for you. Um, if you want to make maps on the web, there's ArcGIS Online. There's also a, a program that's pretty popular called Cardo. Cardo is great if you're used to using HTML and web stuff and JavaScript and PHP and all that stuff. It works with web designers really well. What if you want to do network analysis where we're looking at how um, different uh, entities, be they people or publications or something like that, how, how they have relationships with each other. There's a few programs that we can use to visualize that. Gephi is probably the most popular one right now. It is um, very buggy difficult to use, uh, you know, it's got some, a lot of technical terms and things that you'll have to look up the documentation on, but it's free and open source. So right now it's the most popular. Um, Node Excel is an extension that you can add to Microsoft Excel if you have a PC, doesn't, doesn't work for Macs. Voss Viewer is a very popular tool to use if you're doing bibliometric analysis. So this is if you're looking at uh, networks of researchers, networks of publishers, um, uh, uh, citations, things like that. Um, and the Health Sciences Library does a lot of work with Boss Viewer. So if um, that's something you're interested in, it might be a good idea to go over there. Um, if you need some uh, network tools online, RAW Graphs doesn't do all these network visualizations, but it does some particularly hierarchies of trees and things like that. So if we have all these tools um, that have a graphical user interface, then why do we need to learn a programming language? Why would we want to do that? 
Well, for one, when you're using those, those tools, those easier tools with the user interface, um, you're not documenting your work, okay? You don't have a record of everything you've done to create that chart in Microsoft Excel or in Tableau. If you're using a programming language, you will. Your work will be reproducible and you can justify uh, your decisions with your code that you've written. Also, there's a lot of things that those um, other tools still can't do, which is uh, animation for one, okay? So there, right now there's no uh, tool with a, a graphical user interface that I'm aware of that does uh, any type of uh, uh, interesting or advanced uh, animation. You'll probably want to use JavaScript to do something like that or are um, or there, there are another options using a programming language. Also, if you're doing um, statistical analysis, you need to find out if you've got a correlation and see a p-value or run a t-test or something like that. It would make a lot more sense to do that um, with a programming language because you can do both that and visualization at the same time. These other tools with a graphical user interface, they don't, they don't usually have a lot of robust uh, statistical analysis tools uh, or options with them. Um, finally, some resources for reading. Um, the <coughs> books uh, that we have available on data visualization, um, the most popular ones are written by Edward Tufte. He's probably the most uh, uh, popular author in this field. A lot of the, <coughs> the work he's done is foundational so you'll see that uh, a lot of the, the information, the best practices and things uh, that I've given you are based on a lot of his, his work. Um, and his books are really cool to just look at. They're full of visualizations. Um, they're, very, they're, they're beautiful and they're interesting. You can find them here at the library. Again, check the catalog to make sure they're not checked out. Also, um, William S. Cleveland, uh, he's done some work in this area as well. It's a little bit older, but it's still very fundamental and a lot of it is, is relevant still today. And then if you like looking at blogs um, to keep up to date on the types of visualizations that are being used now and the different techniques that people are using, you can take a look at flowing data. That tends to aggregate a lot of uh, data visualizations from all different um, websites and newspapers and things like that. Um, Information is Beautiful is another good one. And then if you really liked looking at bad visualizations and talking about what was wrong with them and how to fix them, Junk Charts is a blog that does that. And then finally, if you want to go to any more of our events, you can go to this page on the library website, which will give you a list of events that are happening here at the Research Hub. So does anybody have any questions? All right, well, feel free to come up and ask me questions if you have any afterwards. And otherwise, thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy your evening.